People tell me they have to put my book down while reading it because they get so angry they cannot continue. And I think one of those sections is the section on women and children. Basic fact, no data on women, no data on children. When women and children were told, you need to buy on and get in line with these recommendations that we're advising for middle-aged men to prevent heart disease, we are applying them to you too based on zero data, zero. So this is going on in the 90s. The National Institutes of Health says, oh, wow, we better get some data for women and children who we've been including in these recommendations to help middle-aged men prevent heart disease. And so they start, maybe it was the late 80s, they start doing experiments on women. The largest ever nutrition trial ever undertaken was the Women's Health Initiative on nearly 49,000 women. They put those women for seven years on a low-fat diet. So, you know, no butter, margarine instead of butter, reduce your meat, reduce your cheese, low-fat dairy. After seven years of that, the results were the low-fat diet had no effect on meaningfully losing weight, no effect on t preventing type 2 diabetes, no effect on preventing heart disease, nor any kind of cancer. None. And in a couple of uh, other experiments that I unearthed that had been kind of just, I don't know, forgotten, um, that were also funded by the National Institutes of Health, it found out that when women go on the low-fat diet, they might even be um, increasing their risk of heart disease more than everybody when they go on a low-fat diet. Their HDL, which is their good cholesterol, falls. And usually their triglycerides go up. Okay, so those are two signs that your risk of heart disease is getting worse. And those effects are worse in women than in men on the low-fat diet, meaning that women might suffer a greater increase in risk of heart, of heart disease by going on a low-fat diet. Hey, my friend, welcome back. It's Mike Mutzel with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks, as always, for showing up, for tuning in. This episode with Nina Teicholz is absolutely amazing. It's one of my, my favorite videos that we've posted so far this year. You know, Nina and I have been going back and forth for the past year and a half trying to get this scheduled. So we caught up in her New York City apartment, her condominium. Uh, it's a great, great discussion. So you're gonna hear a little bit of ambient background noise, horn honking, characteristic taxis, you know, of New York City uh, making noise, but it's not too bad. So bear with it. And if you have not read Nina's book, please do so. It's an amazing read, The Big Fat Surprise is really changing the paradigm. You know, it's been vetted by The Lancet, by the British Journal of Medicine and, and other institutions who are realizing that, you know what, some of the guidelines that uh, we adhere to when it comes to nutrition and managing lipid disorders and so forth, uh, you know, cholesterol medic medication and recommendations thereof uh, are being augmented uh, because of the work that Nina has unearthed. So support her mission, support the book. She's got a great uh, website called The Nutrition Coalition that she's working on. I'll put the link below this video, which is sponsored by ButcherBox.com. Friends, I love, love this company because their core values and your core values and my core values are all on the same wavelength. They realize that for humans to be healthy, they need to eat healthy food. And most often times, you know, people go to the grocery store and even if they spend the extra money to buy what they see on the label as grass-fed beef, sometimes that is not truly grass-fed at all. And what I mean by that is oftentimes this quote unquote grass fed beef is really from animals in feedlots eating grass pellets, which are loaded with wood chips and other really, you know, non grass related compounds, but they're still able to put that on the label. So that's not really totally healthy. What you want is to be eating, you know, beef from natural cattle that are out in nature, or, you know, rummaging through grass and eating grass and, and sequestering uh, the, the fecal matter back into the soil to, for the regeneration of carbon and, and affecting the soil microbiome and so forth. So that's how nature intended cattle to live and that's how you should eat them. And that's Butcher Box's mission to make sure that we're really getting high quality beef and chicken and pasture raised chicken and heritage pork products every single time. So it takes a guesswork out. So, you know, sometimes when we go to the grocery store, we just keep our fingers crossed and hope that we're getting healthy, uh, you know, animal products and they were treated humanely. But every time you order from butcherbox.com, you know that that is the case. That is their inclusion criteria. That's a core mission statement. That's why they are in business and doing very well. Now, in the month of June, they have this promotion going on. They do this every June and they actually have to shut it down early because it's so popular. So what I encourage you, if you're new to ButcherBox, if you haven't ordered from them before, go to butcherbox.com. On their website, you're gonna see the free bacon for life campaign. 
Friends, this is an amazing deal. If you eat bacon or your kids like bacon, I know I do, I like high quality bacon from Heritage Pigs that's hormone free and sugar free. That's exactly what ButcherBox sells, that's what they provide. And if you sign up and get a new account with them, guess what, you get free bacon for life with every single order. Okay. Now it's not free. You have to sign, actually sign up and become a customer, but every order after that, you're going to get a free package of bacon from hormone free, happy pigs, and it's sugar free. So these are heritage pigs. It tastes absolutely amazing, really rich and complex flavors. So if you like that idea and you want to support a company who's really changing the industry, meaning changing the food industry, changing our perception of what healthy food really is and what should be, support butcherbox.com, check out their website and some of the free recipes they have. They have an awesome product. So I uh, really appreciate their support. Appreciate you tuning in and let's dive back into it with Nina. I just want to commend you for all the work that you've done. I was reading through your book and for I think the cover price on the, on the paperback I have is $19. I was like, I would be very grateful if I pay like $750 because I know how much research went into that. So um, I would be very grateful for $750. Right? <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, you get, Thanks. we're getting like a digital download of nine years of your life. Yeah, that's true. For 18 bucks, you're like, this is amazing. So yeah. um, I think a lot of our listeners are familiar with like kind of the trajectory of how you got into this, writing an article about trans fats. Um, was it, were you surprised when you started diving into the research and realized that like what we know to be true, mm -hmm. that supposedly fats and cholesterol are bad for us is really like a lot of like industry bias and, and people trying to project their own opinions. Were you kind of, was that hard to grapple with for you at first or? You know, I think any of us who encounter this information, like it's just such a huge lie basically, and, or you know, reversal of everything that you ever believe for decades of your life, my life, anybody else's life, like how could you not be astonished? Right. And I think, you know, that kind of comes in waves, like, could this really be wrong? No, it can't really be wrong. And then you check everything, you check it. That's why it took me so long to do my research, because I kept saying, you know, I must be wrong. This must be wrong. Where is the, you know, where am I not understanding? Where am I not getting it? And then, and just again and again and again and again, you see, wow, it just really doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. Cholesterol doesn't add up. Saturated fats, wow, there never was any evidence. And there was still never any, any evidence. And, and so, you know, ultimately, like, it kind of washes over you. And, and there is, like, this feeling of kind of almost existential nausea, like, wow, if this is wrong, these, like, deeply held beliefs, how much of our everything we believe in is wrong. Like it really changes the way you, or at least I did, it changed the way I felt about truth. You know, mm -hmm. the truth that I think I know. It seems like almost anything could be wrong. And along those lines, you did a good job within the book to really not be overly biased and really project the information in a really kind of objective way. Um, whereas you, you talk about, was it confirmation bias? Was that, or? Um, and it, so we, we see people infusing, even in the low carb community, we kind of see that. So. Um, how did you train yourself to like look at things and realize like, okay, I need to look at this like totally objectively because this is going to really be a powerful, was that like a constant part of, like in the back of your head when you're doing this research? Yeah, it's interesting about, I should just explain for people who don't know, you know, what is confirmation bias? Like we all have confirmation bias. We look at the world and we tend to see the things that confirm all of our beliefs. And we tend to just kind of not see the things that don't confirm our beliefs. And that's normal for normal people. Scientists are taught to be different. They're taught to distrust themselves and to try to prove themselves wrong. Like that's the education and formation of the scientific mind. You know, obviously that was not the case in nutrition science. There was, you know, one of the amazing salient characteristics of Ansel Keys was his ability to only select all the evidence that confirmed his ideas and not just ignore, but uh, like actively bully out of existence any evidence to the contrary or any scientist promoting evidence to the contrary, that was his kind of modus vivendi. And he used to say, like, I'm right until proven wrong, which is the opposite of science. Science is supposed to be you are wrong, you are wrong. You know, you might be a little less wrong as the evidence grows in your favor, but you can never say I'm right. right. That's the opposite of science. So I think for me, I tried very hard in seeing bad science to try to emulate what is supposed to be good science. Good science is supposed to be distrusting yourself at every instance, right? Yeah. Also, for me, I mean, frankly, let's just be honest. To be a, to be going out with a book that is so controversial, where I knew I would be beaten up mm -hmm. um, by everyone, um, 
you know, the, just the fear factor was huge, like that I would be wrong, that I, somebody would catch me out on something that, you know, this fact would be wrong or that would be wrong. So that's why I just kept checking and double checking. Actually, it, this is the site um, where like, I think pretty much every night I would lay down on the floor uh, with my husband you sits on this couch in the evenings and I'd lay down the floor and he'd be like, Ugh, not again. I was like, yeah. I can't do this. How could I do this? How could I go out with this book? You know, just the fear, the terror that you're doing something that's so controversial mm -hmm. is, is overwhelming and, and such an incredibly strong motivational factor in making sure that you get it right. Totally. So like all the tables that weren't really talked about, like in Ansel Keys' study, when he uh, neglected to include Lent in the Crete, the yeah. seven country study was was that That's like right. a big when you read that and you're like oh my gosh these subjects like were some of them were fasting yet he's including that data and didn't report it so right. it's it some of those little subtle facts that started to get your yeah, yeah. there's so many moments like that yeah. in the history of my research so the one you're talking about is when i discovered that this all important study the seven country study by ansel keys the one that is like the foundation of everything that we came to believe about cholesterol and fat, that um, Ansel Keys went to the island of Crete, and um, which is one of the places he studied. They were his star pupils because they seemed to be eating the lowest amount of saturated fat, and yet they had the, also the lowest rates of heart disease. Well, it turns out one of his three visits there was during Lent, which during which they steadfastly avoided all animal foods. I mean, it was an incredibly rigorous version of Lent. So he obviously undercounted the amount of saturated fats that they had eaten. And so coming across that and then actually seeing how he tried to bury that data, like trying to put it in journals, like non-English language journals, mm -hmm. burying his dietary data. And I mean, you just can't believe like the, the you can't believe something like that. And I have to say that is not the only instance. I mean, there's a nut, there's the story of the data on the Framingham study buried in the basement of NIH and never published. And you get your hands on that document. You're like, wow, saturated fat has no correlation with heart disease. Wow. Never published in one of the most important studies ever funded by NIH. Interesting. I mean, there's a lot of there's stories lot like of that. And that's when you start to believe, wow, I'm <laughs> living in this, you know, what feels like a kind of a world of conspiracy, but you realize there really was something beyond confirmation bias, not just ignoring evidence to the contrary, but actively suppressing evidence to the contrary. Yeah. Yeah, so, so going back to it, so there's this whole thing called the sunk cost bias, which, are you familiar? Probably I, yeah, I mean, a little bit. intuitive. Yeah, so we, we invest so much time and resources into something, we don't want to admit that it's wrong or it's a bad endeavor. Um, do you think that was part of it, or was there more like deeper rooted financial or self-centered aspirations to like, hammer this point home? So that is a complex, there's a complex answer to that question because yeah. there were multiple forces uh, in keeping this kind of hypothesis in place, right? So there is, first of all, a set of scientists who truly believe in it, right? Ansel Keys and his colleagues in the very beginning, in the 50s and 60s, even in the 70s, I think they were true believers. They really wanted to be right. They thought they had the answer to heart disease. It's a huge public health issue and they have the solution. So, and they desperately want to be right. So, and at some point they can't be wrong. Like, how could they be wrong? And then there's the added factor of institutions getting invested in it. So since, you know, from the very start, the National Institutes of Health, the American Heart Association, they were the earliest ones who invested themselves fully in this hypothesis, right? So then they are invested. And then the entire US government gets on board in terms of the USDA, our dietary guidelines, right? So now the entire federal government is invested in this hypothesis and you have this other added factor of institutional rigidities, right? Not only can they not be wrong, but they can't be flip-flopping on their publics. Mm. If they're wrong, maybe they'd be sued, you know, uh, Maybe this is a little bit of a tangent, but recently I saw the movie, the post about the Pentagon Papers, about this issue the government couldn't be wrong in the Vietnam War, right? Mm -hmm. They knew it was a futile exercise, but they could not be wrong on something that was so big. And it made me think, I bet you if I went digging in at National Institutes of Health, there would be some serious, there would be our Pentagon Papers yeah. saying, uh-oh, none of our trials confirm that this diet works. We're probably wrong. But what are we going to do? How could how do we reverse out of this? Yeah. Um, so, and then there's this question of industry funding, which is usually the first to leaps to everybody's mind. You know, special interests. What is the food industry doing? Um, and there is certainly 
that factor. You see from the very early, you know, in the very beginning, really, most people think it's the sugar industry, but in my research, what I find, it was really largely the vegetable oil industry because if you're not eating saturated fats, right, if you're told not to eat saturated fats, what are you supposed to eat instead? Polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Yeah. So in all my research, I found all these vegetable oil companies funding the American Heart Association, launching the American Heart Association. Really um, launching? I didn't know that. Launching the American Heart oh my Association. Gosh. So we're talking like corn, sanola. Well, in that seed. day, it was mainly um, safflower, sorry, um, it was mainly cottonseed oil um, and sunflower, and then it, soybean kind of just took over. But mm. in those days, so the earliest one was Crisco oil. It was a, a product of Procter & Gamble. And, um, well, the story is the American Heart Association, because heart disease was relatively new and rare, was this small, I mean, cardiologists were relatively unknown, a new profession, and they were this kind of sleepy little um, office with n almost no money, no income, and Procter & Gamble targeted them and made them the designee of a very popular radio show, and overnight, uh, according to the American Heart Association's own official history, millions of dollars flowed into their coffers and transformed them into the giant powerhouse that they are today. And that That's all happened crazy. in 1948. Right. So, and, fr and from that, that day onward, the American Heart Association was very closely allied with the National Institutes of Health. And coincidentally, the American Heart Association comes out saying, you should have vegetable oils instead of saturated fats. Um, in order to cure heart disease. Yeah, and so, I would love to dive into the problems with that. Well, the oxidation is that in your eyes is that, I mean, there's a lot of issues you, with taking out, you know, the nutrient density of the animal fats, but right. but the is it the oxidation point of some of the safflower and the corn and stuff, and especially how it's cooked? Is that kind of one of the main problems? Yeah, I mean, vegetable oils, you know, they were used as lubricants for industrial machinery, mm. <laughs> and they were really um, not meant for human consumption and it really was Procter and Gamble who looked at um, who decided to to make um, well first it was Crisco uh, as a human something for human food consumption starting in 1911 and uh, before that Americans had cooked with lard and butter mm -hmm. like people most European uh, Western European nations um, had been the same so vegetable oils always had the problem of being highly unstable and going rancid, which is the same as saying they're, they're oxidated, right? Yeah. And that is, um, they're not really vegetable oils, they're made from seeds, right? Cotton seeds, sunflower, safflower, soybean, it's a bean. Um, and, and so that oil oxidizes very easily, especially when it's heated. And so that is why um, they had to harden it to make it into originally Crisco, but also then margarine. That hardening process uh, actually stabilized it. So, but then they found out that that hardening process called hydrogenation had the um, unfortunate side effect of producing trans fats. So we had to get rid of trans fats. You know, now we're a, we are a trans fat free food supply or we will be soon. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a huge problem for vegetable oil manufacturers because they had to go back to using just regular old vegetable, non-hardened, non-stable oils. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have, like in McDonald's, Burger King, all of those fast food chains have just gone back to frying their french fries and everything in unstabilized oils that, you know, when they are heated to high temperatures and not even very high temperatures, like if you just left it on your counter, it would, under just the natural conditions, it would oxidize. But under these high, intensely high temperatures in, in fryers, they oxidize, they degrade into hundreds of oxidation products. Some of them are known toxins like aldehydes, which is something that is incredibly scary. They enter the food. It's known that they enter the food that you then eat, that fried food, um, and it gets into the air. Uh, it, it's, like, they're really toxic. Um, mm. and, and I should say, even before all of that, which is scary, in all the clinical trials on tens of thousands of Americans funded by the National Institutes of Health, when they did these experiments and they replaced saturated fats with polyunsaturated vegetable oils, like instead of meat, they had soy-filled burgers, and instead of butter, they had margarine. In all of those trials, nearly all of those trials, the people on the high polyunsaturated fat diets always displayed higher rates of death from cancer. Mm. Um, so, and that 
was so concerning to the National Institutes of Health that in the early 1980s they had this series of really high-level meetings saying, what's going on with this side effect of cancer? And they could never figure it out. Hmm. So they just dropped the subject. Wow. And you kind of ignored it and said, we'll revisit that and table it for later, eh? They basically said, look, it's so important to avoid saturated fats for heart disease that we, we just consider cancer to be a lesser problem. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's so, it's, I think the top causes of premature morbidity when it comes to health, right? Is it heart disease, autoimmune, and then cancer, or heart disease, cancer, autoimmune? I can't remember. I mean, number one, number yeah. two killers in America are heart disease and cancer. Mm -hmm. I think it's usually heart disease is number one and number two, but they're very close. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, so it was just a trade-off, really. They just, they just said heart disease was at that point their number one priority, so we're not going to worry about cancer. Wow, that is, that is wild. Um, so going back, I think it's, you know, looking, there was a, a book that you uh, talked about. It was someone who had looked at like early settlers in America. Um, Let's get meat back on the menus. I think it's the title of the book. I could be wrong. It was in chapter three or something. And the, the per capita uh, amount of meat that we're having uh, now in present day mm -hmm. compared to like in the 1800s, it's pretty astounding, the meat and butter. What are those facts? Yeah, about? I think it's called meat, putting meat on the American table. But it's this researcher who went back and he looked at how much red meat Americans used to eat. And uh, he had no like agenda going into this. It was like his PhD research mm -hmm. thesis or something. And he found, he went back to like records of what they fed the slaves and, you know, and, and research into market research. And he looked at all the menus and he looked at what they household, individual households were buying because they all kept records of, you know, of what they bought. And he concluded uh, that Americans used to eat three to four times more red meat than we do today. That is just astonishing. Yeah, Because, you know, the that. story that we're told is like, oh, we eat record amounts of red meat, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they, but they always use as their starting point, 1970, which was like a low point for meat consumption in America. So we definitely eat more than we did in the 1970s. But if you look historically, like since the early 1800s, like the slaves got more red meat than we do today. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and, you know, and it was considered essential because that was what made them strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, meat really does, you know, it makes you strong. So that was just considered an essential part of their diet. Yeah. And vegetables were, um, w let's see, so in the Inuit, and then I think uh, George Mann talks about it um, in the, uh, what's, not the Hadza? The Maasai. The Maasai warriors, right. Yeah, so vegetables were, were only when there was like no meat around, certain seasons kind of thing. Was that? Yeah, I mean, you have to think about that, like, for anybody who lives in a non-temperate climate, vegetables are not available. Vegetables and fruit are simply not available for, you know, for a large part of the year, depending on where you live. I mean, you might, you might be able to, to store some root vegetables, um, but you're really not eating, like, berries and greens for most of the year. So that's, that's just always seemed to me like such a strange common sense point that I don't really understand how we could like all be Mediterranean when a lot of us don't live in climates like the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. But it was observed um, in many different areas that I researched that vegetables were clearly not favored. I mean, even in this country in the um, 18, late 1800s, one of the early nutrition researchers issued a recommendation saying vegetables are relatively nutrient poor and for households where they are, eat for poor households basically not to bother buying vegetables because they just didn't add enough nutrient density to the families, you know, to their, to what a family needed to survive. Yeah. Um, and then there you can find many cultures where the um, vegetables are what you added to the, to the meal when you just, you had to extend you know, just to extend the meal in order to feed more people. I mean, right. the Maasai warriors, as you say, they're kind of an extreme example, but they were, they're unique in that they were documented by a biochemist from the University of Vanderbilt, George Mann, and he went out and he measured, their, he, he gave them like electrocardiograms and he looked at what they ate and he, you know, he did very detailed scientific investigations and he found out that the men, the warriors, ate only fat and blood, sorry, blood, milk, and meat. That was their entire diet. It's wild. And, and a lot of meat, right? I mean, it's pounds. Yeah, during pounds slaughter. of meat during, yeah. you know, and then that's all they survived on. He couldn't find any evidence of heart attacks. Um, he took electrocardiograms on them. And, um, and the women who, were, who did not have as, 
they weren't, you know, the women weren't doing the fighting or the hunting, so they didn't need to be as fit. The women were the ones who would eat more vegetable foods. Mm, interesting. So what do you think the message is here for people? Because I think some people um, hear this and they think, oh, well, vegetables might be bad for me. Because I do see this on Twitter. Yeah. So, so it's a message that, you know, meat and uh, animal fat are just higher in nutrition. And we shouldn't, like, avoid vegetables altogether. But realistically, if we were to rewind the clock or take away civilization as we know it, you know, a global transplant of food and all that, that we just wouldn't be as eating, eating as many vegetables as we probably are being told that we should eat. Yeah, okay, so it's a really important question. Like, yeah. what is the point of talking about these cultures that are eating a lot of meat and fat, right? Yeah. The reason that I put them in my book is the main point is to show this is evidence to the contrary of what we believe, right? So these are scientific observations that clearly show that, you know, that our, the advice to eat mainly fruits and vegetables and grains uh, and that that's good for health, this is not supported by all the science. There's, a, there's important contradictory evidence that needs to be considered. Yeah. Super important to consider that because when you have contradictory evidence like that, it means your hypothesis is wrong. <laughs> you need to reevaluate your hypothesis. And that's why I included it in my book. I don't include it in my book and I don't talk about it to make the point that I think people should be on a meat only, fat only diet and should not eat fruits and vegetables. I mean, uh, I think it's clear that you can be on that diet and that is well, is produces healthy people or some healthy people for some people. I think other people have clearly thrived on diets higher in fruits and vegetables. There's no question about it. Um, and when making a decision for yourself or your your family or what's good for you, you do have to consider, you know, where are you gonna get your nutrition? Like, we don't really talk about this much. You know, it used to be, before the obsession with heart disease, that, you know, nutrition researchers were mainly interested in how do you get the nutrients you need to survive, to sustain human life and reproduce, right? Where were those nutrients going to come from? And the reality is that the nutrients that we need in their most bioavailable form, meaning your body can use them and absorb them, come from animal foods. Yeah. That's just that's just the reality. Right. So you have to eat like a room full of spinach to get the iron you need, and it's not in the same. It's not as bioavailable to you as eating, you know, a piece of a piece of meat like this size, red sure. meat. Right. And I think an important. Uh, concept that's woven into your book is you talk about it's not just the muscle meat but what ancestral humans or folks would eat is the tongue and the liver and other organs yeah. so I think you know and, and the reason why I want to bring this up is there's this whole trend of these carnivorous people and you know waving t-bone steaks and ribeyes and okay fine but it's there's that no diversity in the nutrients some of the nutrients that you're talking about might be highly concentrated in muscle meat and others are in the liver or the tongue or what have you. So let's talk about were you kind of surprised to find this diversity of the organs that were eaten? eaten? Yeah, I mean, the most nutrient dense food on the planet is probably liver. Um, you know, yuck. I don't like, I don't like <laughs> Do liver. You liver personally? <laughs> I try to like sneak it into other yeah. things that we eat because I just didn't grow up with a taste for it. I mean, so we've completely gotten out of the habit of eating what are, you know, these odd bits, right? It used to be in almost every culture has a tradition of, you know, like haggis in Scottish culture. Like that's all innards, you know, that's the stuff that, and, 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 um, and, but that's what people used to eat. And if you look at, uh, what animals go for when they kill another animal, I mean, like a lion, mm -hmm. they go, they don't go for the muscle meat. They go for all the innards because that is where all the nutrients are. Yeah. You know, the heart, the, <laughs> I mean, all of that is really where you find nutrients. Um, so yes, I mean, one of the things that people do when they discover this information is they try to go back and find recipes and figure out how to bring these kinds of foods back into their life. I mean, I served um, brain. Oh wow! It's not called brain. There's a there's a word for it, but I forget mm. it. Um, to my kids, and I passed it off successfully mm -hmm. as chicken. But they're like, oh, it's a little chewy. But yeah. I'm like, wow, but that doesn't taste so bad. <laughs> was it beef brain? It was. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't look weird, can... and it doesn't yeah. taste weird. But it's just like the whole concept is so weird that I think it's hard for people to to reacquaint themselves with that idea. Yeah, I think it's an important point. You know, because if we're going to encourage people to get back to their roots a little bit, I think. Uh, it's important to stress that it's not just the ribeye and t-bone st steaks. While there are some people that may thrive on that, um, 
like you talked about in the book, I mean, the, there's a lot of uh, these different organs and the animals too. I, I, we have backyard chickens. We have two turkeys and a raccoon got to one of them. They didn't touch any of the breast meat or anything. They just ate the organs and left the carcass there and went on to the next one. It was crazy. That's so I thought, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so they, they didn't even touch it yet. We, that's all we eat. Well, and I think it's just so it's important to, to say that when you talk about going back to your cultural heritage, I mean, this is part of a way of reacquainting yourself to each and every one of us to our own particular food heritage of which this in every food heritage, there's some version of, of these kinds of dishes made from animal organs, you know, organ meat. Uh, you mentioned chicken. And we see a lot of people, part of the, going back to these recommendations and the, the findings of Ansel Keys and others in the 50s was we want lean, clean protein and all that. And so chicken, our, our poultry consumption dramatically increased. We talk about in the book how chickens were prized more for their eggs and eaten on a, a small, small occasion. Uh, question for you, is there anything inherently wrong with eating chicken or is it toxic of some sorts or what were your thoughts there? Um, I don't know if it's toxic per se, but I will say that, uh, first of all, you're right. We have increased, since 1970 to today, we've increased consumption of chicken poultry by 121%. Like, it's just gone off the charts. Um, I do know that chicken is relatively nutrient poor. Yeah. So you are not getting anywhere near the nutrients that you would if you were eating red meat. Um, so it's it's really not sort of the health food that we, that we think it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's something that people have come to associate because it's relatively low in saturated fat, but you know, this whole thing that there's no saturated fat in chicken and red meat is so high in saturated fat, I mean, it, all foods are a combination of different kinds of fats. That's like one really important thing to know. I mean, yeah. that like your average porterhouse steak is one third saturated fat. The rest of it, another third of it is the same kind of fat that you get in olive oil. Did you know that? Mm. No. So, I mean, and pork is almost all the kind of fat that you get in olive oil, but people think it's like some, you know, toxic. Yeah, yeah. you know, artery clogging fat, but it's not. Yeah. Um, so, that's just kind of an interesting, another one of these, like the kind of way that nutrition science has been simplified so that we all believe that, like, you know, in a very simple way, I know that that's the way it's sold to us to try to make it all digestible, but, you know, it's worth knowing these complexities. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it, it can affect the trajectory of one's health. I think it's really interesting. But a side note on the chickens. So we have backyard chickens, as I mentioned. They love meat. They absolutely, it's crazy. So they eat a lot of bugs and worms all day. But in the winter when the ground is cold, they, they can't get access to that. So we give them meat. And you would think that they're like dogs. They just all go after it and they peck each other if one's trying to get in there. So anyway, the chicken that most people are getting is just they're eating the canola and the, you know, the flaxseed and all the, the byproducts of, of whatever, you know, the food industry and so forth. So it's, it's not the healthiest meat anyway. Um, I think they give them like leftover like bread and cookies. That's yeah. one of the things I heard. They just give them absolute junk. Yeah. And they're not like pigs, which can turn <laughs> junk into just, like some kind of, yeah. like into healthy food. I don't think chickens do it quite so successfully. Craziness. Yeah. So anyway, folks, uh, what was ironic is I was reading your book on the plane and there was a woman next to me bless her heart, but she was having this chicken salad um, and she poured the, you know, dr this dressing, it was, it looked, it said soy something, low fat, and it was just like, this information really needs to get out there. So the, the consequence, you're going back to why do the details matter, the consequence of not knowing this information can really affect child you know, development, growth, uh, stature. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that uh, I love vegetables, so I was, uh, I'm glad I read this too, you know, a lot of things that really took me by surprise. So what are some of these consequences, um, particularly for women and children, of like not getting these good animal fats and meat and protein? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a particularly tragic subject. People tell me they have to put my book down because, while reading it, because they get so angry they cannot continue. And I think one of those sections is the section on women and children, yeah. um, because, you know, like basic fact, no data on women, no data on children. When women and when children were told, you need to buy on and get in line with these recommendations that we're advising for middle-aged men to prevent heart disease, we are applying them to you too based on zero data, zero. And, you know, and so this is going on in the 90s, 
the National Institutes of Health says, oh, wow, we better get some data for women and children who we've been including in these recommendations to help middle-aged men prevent heart disease. And so they start, maybe it was the late 80s, they start doing experiments. They do experiments on women. The largest ever nutrition trial ever undertaken was the Women's Health Initiative on nearly 49,000 women. They put those women for seven years on a low-fat diet. So, you know, no butter, margarine instead of butter, reduce your meat, reduce your cheese, low-fat dairy. After seven years of that, the results were the low-fat diet had no effect on meaningfully losing weight, no effect on t preventing type 2 diabetes, no effect on preventing heart disease, nor any kind of cancer. None. Crazy. And in, an, in a couple of uh, other experiments that I unearthed that had been kind of just... I don't know, forgotten, um, that were also funded by the National Institutes of Health, it found out that when women go on the low-fat diet, they might even be um, increasing their risk of heart disease more than everybody when they go on a low-fat diet. Their HDL, which is their good cholesterol, falls. And usually their triglycerides go up. Okay, so those are two signs that your risk of heart disease is getting worse. And those effects are worse in women than in men on the low-fat diet, meaning mm. that women might suffer a greater increase in risk of heart, of heart disease by going on a low-fat diet. Wow. Um, so yeah. that's pretty... <laughs> Scary stuff. That's pretty bad. Was and that the, the Boeing? Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, okay. the Boeing One. studies were the ones where the women, they went and looked at women, and it looked like you know, women looked worse on the low-fat diet than the men. Those studies were never cited, never quoted. You know, they're part of the studies that, you know, that are kind of known as silent studies. Mm. They're done, they come out, but they don't have the results that everybody hoped they would or uh, wanted to confirm their hypothesis, so they're just forgotten. They're never cited in reviews. They're not talked about. They disappear from the literature. And in fact, I'm sorry, but that yeah. NIH, the Women's Health Initiative, the one I told you, the largest ever study ever undertaken on nutrition, yeah. that one has also somehow become a silent study. Not quoted by any dietary guideline committee, not cited by anybody, people who are promoting the low-fat diet, they don't cite the Women's Health Initiative. It's not in our, the database that is used to uh, produce our, our government guidelines. Not there. It's crazy. So yeah, well, I definitely want to get to evidence-based medicine and yeah, define yeah. that because it's like, are we really practicing evidence-based medicine? I think we all know the answer to that when it comes to dietary recommendations. But let's talk about why these studies aren't cited. What does that mean? So, so if you're a young, ambitious science, scientist and you want to get grants and you want to do more studies, and heaven forbid you, you cite one of these studies, what does that mean potentially for your career? And, and what sort of conversations have you had with scientists and, and what have they told you? Like, uh, if you don't agree with a consensus, like what happens? Well, I mean, this is one, this is a sort of a lesson of nutrition science for all of science, but you know, what happens when you as a scientist have a view that is different than the kind of status quo reigning hypothesis endorsed by the National Institute of Health, endorsed by every professional health association. What happened to those scientists in nutrition? They were, they were basically punished for their beliefs. You know, they, and how does that happen? To be punished as a scientist means you don't get research grants from National Institutes of Health, so you can't do research. So you are unable to be a science. You are you you no longer are invited to any conferences because nobody wants to hear your point of view. It's awkward for them to hear it. They, you can't get your research published. Um, you know how many scientists did I talk to say they couldn't get they they just can't get their studies published? I mean this is what's been happening to the low carb diet. You know all the studies that have been done. There have been uh, more than seventy clinical trials done on the low carb diet. I can't tell you. I know many of those researchers telling me. I couldn't get this published. I couldn't. I, you know, I had to go to six different journals, and uh, you know, what whatever their complaints were were trivial. But basically, the people who sit on those editorial boards are the people who are defending this to the, you know the status quo low fat diet, and they don't want to see those studies out there. I heard a story by um, one of the um, the lead researchers of the Framingham study, one of the most important. Um, epidemiological studies that the, the government ever undertook, and he, his name was George Mann, and he, uh, he was consistently an outspoken critic of Ansel Keys and this hypothesis about saturated fat and cholesterol, and he, and he was a leading scientist in his day, and, and he was getting results in framing him. He was responsible for the, the diet part of the study, which was not showing what they wanted him to show, and he 
Um, and he wouldn't start, stop speaking out about it, even though he had been warned. <clears throat> and one day he told me that an uh, NIH secretary pulled him out into the hallway and said, you know, if you continue your opposition to Ansel Keys, you're going to lose your research grant. And shortly thereafter, he lost it. That's crazy. And, and that is not an isolated story. Um, you know, there are stories of researchers having their, their, their entire uh, study, having the pu plug pulled on it when they got their preliminary results and they're like, we're just ending this study. We're not doing it. Because it was NIH funded or? Because it wasn't coming out with the results that they wanted it right. to. So, and what happens is that, so, and, and you know, other researchers said to me, you know, my career clear, clearly suffered for being in opposition to Ansel Keys. I was no longer invited to these expert panels. Um, my career suffered. But so what happens is, is that the next generation of scientists learn to self-censor. You're not going to go down that line of research. That's, that's career, sure career death. Yeah. So you just, you know, you stay within the realm of what is acceptable discourse in your field. And that is why the new science that we see coming up that has been so extraordinary on, on you know, what happens with carbohydrate restriction and all of that science came from people not in the field of nutrition. It came from people in kind of ancillary fields who were not intimidated by people in their own field or they, they, could, they could rise up the career ladder doing something unpopular mm -hmm. or, or doing something different. You know, they were kinesthesiologists or they, were, they, they, just, they just came from different fields and they were generally curious about diet. But if you are in the field of nutrition science, you, until very recently, you just really could not pursue this line of inquiry. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, do you think with the internet and Facebook and Twitter and a lot of science people now, PhDs, or like yourself, you know, you're, you're active on social media. And so I think there's, a, is there a more level of transparency now? Or would you say it's still to that extent within the silos of academia at some level? I think inside academia, very little of this penetrates. Yeah. You know, they do not respect what is going on outside their own, you know, anointed expert fields. That's mm -hmm. just the reality. I know many of them have read my book, have read Gary's books, but they just, they consider, I mean, to some extent this is changing now, but they're, you know, they consider us like quacks or we're just not part of their field. Mm -hmm. um, and their field is, is slowly changing, but it's very, I mean, in our world, there's paradigm shift, yeah. right? We are shifting. If you if you look at the world in in the media and in what you know what people in health and fitness are talking about, there is paradigm shift. That paradigm shift is is lagging behind in the expert world. So there are a few outspoken voices. I mean, just an amazing thing. Uh, three years after my book is published, The Lancet, a top medical journal, published a full page review of my book. Amazing. Three years later, saying. Wow. Starting out saying, this book will make you angry, but you must reckon with what it says because we have checked it, we've checked the references, and she's right. Cool. Which is what incredible. An honor. It is, That's but amazing. I'm saying, like, I'm, I'm not, I mean, it does sound boastful, but I'm saying it's like, it's part of the paradigm shift that you see happening. You know, again, Lancet, not inside the field of nutrition, you would never see, like, the stalwarts of nutrition saying that. Yeah. But, New England Journal of Medicine would never, or JAMA, is Lancet's UK based. JAMA, right? yeah. 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 Okay, so, so the be BMJ is also pushing the needle on this. I mm -hmm. mean, they understand, like, nutrition science is in a terrible spot right now. Yeah. You know, its consensus position is just not evidence based, it's not reflective of the science. And, and so, there's an increasing recognition by journals um, that there's been a kind of problem of runaway nutrition scientists you know, led by a tight group of experts and that somebody needs to bust in there. It's mm -hmm. not going to be the journalists, you know, and so there needs to be whistleblowers inside the field of science. Right. Yeah, that's key. Uh, people that are out of this book. Would, uh, is it Ufi Rafniskov? Would yeah. he be considered? I, I know he's a cardiologist, but does he publish research as well? I know he's had some lay press books. He is, um, yes, he's been an outspoken critic. He is not a, uh, an insider in the field of nutrition. Like Whatever he publishes is, is ignored completely yeah. um, because it's just not by somebody inside the field of nutrition. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff published now. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Like right now, this week is uh, coming out is a study on... Um, diabetics on more than 400 diabetics. Uh, it's the one year results um, with, uh, with half of them on the ketogenic diet. Mm 
60% of those people on the ketogenic diet have reversed their diagnosis of diabetes. Wow. Something that is considered impossible in the field of nutrition, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Diabetes is considered an, an irreversible progressive disease. Now here's 60% of diabetics reversing their, reversing their diagnosis. So it'll be interesting to see how the nutrition world reacts to that. Is that Finney's work, Finney and Volick? Is it Verta? This is a, the Verta study, right? Okay. Sarah Hallberg is the project uh, leader on that. Yeah, that's um, amazing. But you know, other studies have come out, like, and this is what happened. So there was a study in Israel where it had partial NIH funding, had a Harvard uh, PhD as one of the project leaders. They compared the Mediterranean diet, the low-fat diet, and the low-carb diet. Low-carb diet did best on nearly everything. How is that study reported in the media and everywhere? By the, it was reported as the Mediterranean diet does better than the low-fat diet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing! I didn't know that. Huh. That's just like that's just like par for the course. The yeah. way that that results are just sort of ignored. I mean, it seems impossible. It seems like how could this be true? Like, right. do they not realize that they're sort of lying about what's going on in science? It's crazy. But. Um, Hmm. I think, you know, you know, so that when we talked about uh, what are the factors that make it so hard to change, another factor is this, you know, the investment that professionals make in this hypothesis. You're talking about three generations of scientists who truly have believed this or, you know, believe it very strongly. So yeah. have based their entire careers on it, published hundreds, hundreds of papers on this idea. So how can they change course and reverse out of that? Well, I, I think it's hard for even people like you and I, you know, when we go to the grocery store, you know, um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s and so forth, and that was the, the height of that low-fat era. And still part of me, um, you know, when, like I was, it was funny, I was, when I was thinking about, you know, uh, coming out here and stuff and scheduling with you, I was cooking a piece of lamb and it had a lot of fat on the outside. Yeah. And I started to cut it off and I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? Why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think a lot of us, even if we believe in the ketogenic diet and the power of it or a low carb, you know, diet or real food, um, it, it's like hard, hardwired almost in our DNA. It's, it's like indelibly yeah. inked. Yeah. Do you find yourself ever like... Yeah making egg whites instead of the yolk? I mean, did, yeah. is, or is that totally gone from? Well, no, I mean, I think it's so interesting, people's uh, transition. I would say, they, I've, I get all kinds of emails from people, and there's some people who are like, one day to the next, they're like, you're right. This is what my grandmother ate. She was healthy and thin. Obvious, I'm just, that's it. I'm changing my diet, and, and like from one day to the next, they've completely gone back to the way they used to eat before or eat differently. Some people like you and like me, because I, I just didn't grow up really uh, most of my young adulthood was spent thinking fat was bad and red meat was bad and never touch butter and beware of the cheese. And so for me, it was, took a much, much longer time. I mean, I was a vegetarian for 25 plus years. Wow. So, you know, I just would never eat red meat. Yeah. And so for me, like this idea of eating red meat or buying a piece of raw red meat just seemed so anathema mm -hmm. to... But even I like had this long time memory going back to like eating bitky meatballs that my mother would make and thinking in cream sauce, thinking, wow, that I remember that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it this research that kind of caused you to pivot your viewpoint? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right. I mean you once you start reading the research and you start permitting yourself to taste, enjoy uh, things that you couldn't have imagined before. And then I think what kicks in is like, oh, that's so delicious. Yeah. If you put your spoon in like the drippings off of a, you know, a roast, it's like, oh wow, that's, <laughs> that's better than the roast itself. That's so good. So, you know, you kind of give yourself permission and then you realize like, why wow, you've really been missing something. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I was talking with a friend the other day. He, he did a five day fast. He's a CEO of a tech company. And, and he was like, the only thing I could think about was like a piece of red meat. He's like, I wasn't crazy. He loves like vegetables and espouses the benefits of them. Those are good for the microbiome, etc. He's like, I wasn't craving broccoli, cauliflower, chard. It was red meat, right? So it's like, it's hardwired in us. And I think um, we do, we, you know, one thing that I do grapple with is, is uh, uh, you know, is the meat that we're eating the same as our ancestors? Meaning, you know, that the animals are not maybe as happy as they would have been free range. A lot of us are having feedlot cattle and, you know, they're given antibiotics and hormones and all that. So where does that fit into your own food preferences? 
Yeah, I mean, almost assuredly, we are not eating the same animals that people ate uh, you know, hundreds of years ago. I mean, I will say one thing, which is that in terms of their nutrition, like in terms of the vitamins and minerals in that meat, mm -hmm. um, I think there's very little difference in, yeah. in a piece of conventionally raised beef compared to, you know, grain, ra uh, sorry, grass-fed grass beef. Sure. Um, my feeling is, um, here's my feeling, which is not very politically correct. But, you know, you should, meat is, I think, a healthy food. It contains a lot of vitamins and minerals you can't find elsewhere. And if you can only afford conventional meat, or if that's your preference, that's fine. Um, I think it's still better than having a bowl full of pasta for dinner. Uh, I recognize the value uh, in many ways of having, you know, I think it's important that meat be sustainable, and I think it's, it's, People have their preferences, and I recognize the value of grass-fed beef, and I obviously deplore all situations where cattle are raised in ways that are inhumane. But, you know, the reality is um, we domesticated animals exist as a source of protein for humans, and that involves um, killing them. Yeah. <laughs> and we, as, you know, that's part of the reality of our humanity. And so that is an uncomfortable fact for us, and we used to have rituals and ways of asking forgiveness and we had we were closer to the animals that we consumed and all of that made it part of a sort of an integral human fully human experience that that I think made that uh, something that was real and part of of you know our lives and now we're so divorced from the animals that we consume and that it just seems remote inhumane unknown we don't ask forgiveness we have no process to make it feel like somehow an ethical uh process right so um but in terms of nutrition which is really where i think one has to focus at least i have focused in my research nutritionally i think conventional meat is 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 pretty much equal to other kinds of meat, and it's certainly better than a bowl full of carbs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think people should feel pressured to buy meat that is like $20 a pound. Right. Or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Don't take out a second mortgage to, to, you know, strive for getting the highest quality when you can, but if you can afford it, it's better than... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went to our local butcher the other day, and he's like, this steak is $20 a pound. I was like, wow, I really support everything you're doing, but I can't afford that. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a, yeah, it must taste amazing. That's crazy. Um, one thing that we didn't really talk about that I think is important to understand, so w you, going back to the Women's Health Initiative study yes. and some of, the, some of the research on women at Boeing, I believe. Was it Dr. Knapp? Yes. Knapp, okay. Knapp. Knapp. Or however you pronounce it, but yes. One of them. Um, Good memory. I, I was thinking about this. I was like, well, is it the lack of animal fat, animal protein, or is it the increase in the carbohydrates that's associated when you reduce that, you know, animal product from your diet? Like, I guess if we want to look at, so we see the association, but what's the causality? Like, what's causing the obesity, the diabetes, the increased risk for, or especially in women, you talked about the reduction in HDL with, and increase in LDL. Right. So I think, so we'll just separate a couple different sure. things. In terms of your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, it's been demonstrated that the most effective way to raise your HDL is to eat more saturated fat. It's the only food known to increase your good cholesterol. So your doctor will never tell you, he's like, yeah. your HDL's low, why don't you exercise a little more, or, you know, drink some red wine. The most efficient way to raise your HDL is to increase your saturated fat. So, um, in terms of triglycerides, which are another really important, I mean, your HDL and your triglycerides are probably your most, uh, of everything that is regularly on a cholesterol screening panel, your HDL and your triglycerides, or the ratio thereof, is probably the most uh, accurate predictor of your risk of having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So HDL is driven by saturated fats. Uh, triglycerides are driven entirely by your carbohydrate intake. Large, high amount of carbohydrates, drives up your triglycerides. It's just a reflection of how much, how much carbs they're eating. So if you keep carbs low and saturated fat high, you're in good shape. Mm. Um, and in terms of what drives you know, obesity and diabetes and heart disease, well, they're all thought to be expressions of, uh, uh, manifestations of basically this metabolic dysfunction that um, you know, we cannot say that a high carbohydrate diet causes 
that metabolic dysfunction, what the science really strongly supports saying is that if you reduce your carbohydrates, you will be able to reduce all the signs of that metabolic dysfunction. Right. Okay. So we have not yet done an experiment where we have like increased car in, in a controlled setting of increasing carbohydrates and, and demonstrating uh, obesity and diabetes and heart disease. Um, Unless you consider the entire American population <laughs> over the <laughs> last four years. Of that. Yeah. But, you know, there are other factors that are involved. Sure. People go on high-carbohydrate vegan diets and don't get sick. So, I mean, there's something about the type of carbohydrates that is worse for people. Is it, is it high-carb plus sugar? Mm -hmm. uh, there's some evidence for that. We don't really know what tips you over into metabolic ill health. Right, and, and so that was part of the, that reminds me of the Ornish research, because people were yeah. meditating, they were exercising, they were doing all multivariate approach, which is great, but like to try and single out and say, oh, it's just the vegetables that's causing this. And, and I think in your book you talked about, he kind of admitted, yeah, well, because yeah. you, didn't you, you interviewed him? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he took a multifactorial approach. He had, he took some people off to a, a retreat in Marin and he put the, he, they got meditation and yoga and other exercise and all kind and they're in this incredibly gorgeous place and they're being surrounded by people who are helping them. And then the, the control group, the control group, he left back in San Francisco and did no intervention. So mm. right there, that's not a controlled study. But then, mm. you know, at the end of his experiment where he purportedly showed that people's arteries got clearer or, or uh, had wider diameters um, after going through his intervention. Um, you know, it, is that due to the yoga? Is it due to the supplements they were taking? You know, what does that do to you? You don't know. Mm -hmm. Plus, in the end, two people died in his experimental group, the ones who went to Marin, and only one person died in the control group. So you could say twice the risk of death in the, yeah. on the Ornish diet. Pretty good endpoint. <laughs> Right. It's a stronger endpoint than than the diameter of your artery, which is something that, you know, he was using two different machines and is, is notoriously not linked to your risk of having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So while the approach is nice, the multivariable approach and lifestyle and so forth, but to then ride the coattails of just a, a vegetarian diet is maybe not totally accurate. No, is not accurate yeah, yeah. at all. <laughs> Good. Thanks for being <laughs> blunt about it. Love it. I mean, Dean Ornish is like... He's just an amazing example of somebody who rode on the coattails of this time. Let's also not forget, it's an experiment on under 45 men only, right? Mm. So tiny experiment, outcomes with death higher in your experimental group, multifactorial, and that is the experiment on which he has, you know, published how many books. He's got his diet endorsed by Medicare, so it's the only diet that Medicare will pay for if you, hmm. uh, if, if you want an alternative to surgery, if you've, you know, got heart disease. I mean, yeah. it's incredible what wow. he's made off the back of that study. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the plant-based diet, I think, you know, one kind of semi-high plant-based diet that comes to mind uh, is Mediterranean diet. We hear so much, you know, Mediterranean diet is so healthy and, and I didn't realize that Ansel Keys was involved in kind of pioneering the popularity of this. I think it's super fascinating. So um, what's what do we need to know about the Mediterranean diet? Okay, well, uh, first of all, the Mediterranean diet is it, it was a con it was this concept that Ansel Keys developed, but it was even in the very beginning he acknowledged that it really was not a legitimate scientific concept because there is no one Mediterranean diet. What they eat in France is very different than what they eat in Spain, in Greece, and those those differences are so significant that you can never put them all together into one Mediterranean diet. It was taken as a concept by. Harvard and developed into something commercial, which they introduced it in 1993. It was, they all published books off of it. Um, but really, it was a product, a commercial product that was developed by the European Olive Oil Association. They wanted to sell more olive oil to America. And mm -hmm. so they developed this incredibly brilliant plan of hosting what were known as the best ever series of food, science food, nutrition conferences all over the Mediterranean. Who does not want to go to the Mediterranean on holiday? Right. You know, Greece, Spain, Tunisia. They brought in scientists and chefs and writers and they and, and from that was born this concept of the Mediterranean diet. So everybody had like little sachets of olive oil tucked in their bags at nighttime and their giveaway bags and everybody had a fantastic time. Like who does not have a great time on a Greek vacation? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I say in my book is like, you know, 
uh, there's a reason we have a Mediterranean diet, and that's because everybody wanted to go vacation in the Mediterranean. There's a reason we don't have a Siberian diet, and right, that's right. because who's going to Siberia for their you know next vacation? Yeah. But there was never any science for it. From 1993 up to 2000, early 2014, I think, never a clinical trial showing that the Mediterranean diet produces better health. What there was was a lot of advertising, a lot of Harvard promotion, but no science. So when there was finally a study on the Mediterranean diet that was funded largely by interested industry, agricultural industries in Spain, it was a Spanish team that did this on more than 7,000 people, they didn't have an equivalent control group. So what they found, which is kind of like, that makes it not a really a legitimate trial. But even at the end of that, they found that if you had the Mediterranean diet plus some added nuts or olive oil, you would reduce your risk of heart disease um, by uh, 2%, which is trivial. Yeah. And they only found it for strokes. They didn't find any statistically significant decrease in uh, your, likelihood of had, uh, your likelihood of having a heart attack. Hmm. But that study, you know, everybody by that point, they were so like they were craving the rigorous evidence that they had been lacking and desperately needed in order to justify their diet, that that was just like grabbed by everybody. Front page of the New York Times, written up by Mark Bittman, who's a vegan. So, you know, there's just at that point, there was this like incredible desire for this plant based study to be successful. And that is remains the only study that's been ever been done on the Mediterranean diet. And what I like to say is, you know, Mediterranean diet probably really is a healthy diet if you eat it sure. in the way it was originally eaten. But, you know, there's no reason for all of us to be Mediterranean. I mean, right. we were talking about reclaiming your own food heritage. My, I didn't come from the Mediterranean. I don't want, you know, I'm happy to eat Mediterranean food, but I also like eating the food from my own culture. And, you know, if you're from Sweden, maybe you <laughs> want to be Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> and eat your sure. grandmother's recipes. I mean, this idea that we all have to be Mediterranean is kind of, is sort of culturally offensive. Like we should not have to all be Mediterranean. You know, our ancestors were healthy. Right. Especially if your heritage is not from the Mediterranean. So that's what I mean. Yeah. So you talk about that, like personalizing, and and this whole um, era of precision medicine is emerging that we need to individualize things, which is a key point of your book. Um, but uh, I heard Walter Willett speak at the American Association for Cancer Research in '09, and I remember being impressed by some of his, you know, all the publications and so forth. Yeah. How was he involved with the promotion of the Mediterranean diet? Well, he was the one who authored it in 1993. Uh, that was really his baby mm -hmm. child. In some ways, he was very much like Ansel Keys, and he has a picture of Ansel Keys on his office wall, who's his hero, because Ansel Keys went to the Mediterranean, fell in love especially with Greece, fell in love with Greece. And you can imagine, this is like in the 1950s, so dollar is strong, that, you know, Europe is in ruins. He's like, there's all these pictures of him and his colleagues, you know, swimming and on yachts and like, how good was life back then? Yeah. Um, and loving the food. They had all come from like the Midwest with, you know, boiled potatoes and overcooked vegetables. Like, who does not go to the Mediterranean and fall in love with the food? Yeah. So that's what they did. And and out of that came his like lifelong devotion to that way of eating and, and deciding it was healthy for all Americans. Yeah. Well, Walter Willett did the same. I mean, as I tell the story in my book, he went to the Mediterranean. He like fell in love with the food. There's all these stories about how much he loved the food, and especially in Greece. And then he developed, he then he had a, you know, developed this Mediterranean pyramid. Um, which he published. It's a Harvard publication, and um, and weirdly, uh, they they put in the tiny, teeny tip of the pyramid. That's where meat is. You can have more sugar than meat according mm. to his diet. So he just totally anti red meat. Even though if anybody goes to Mediterranean knows, they ate a lot of meat. I yeah. mean, you don't lamb, go right? And kebabs, lamb yeah. and beef and pork. I mean, you know, if you're in Greece, that's you know, you're, you're not. Vegetables are a nice side dish, but, mm. you know, every meal is, has some meat in it. But Willett had that same experience and came back, and he is the one who launched that diet. Hmm. Interesting. So, okay. So what does that do to the credibility of his research? What other, you know, he's, he's I think, one of the most cited nutrition researchers. Yeah, you he know? is. Well, you know, Dr. Willett and all of his colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health are, are um, they're epidemiologists. And so they, they run two large NIH funded epidemiology studies. The thing to know about epidemiology is they can show association, but not causation. So that 
is a very weak kind of science. It is not supposed to be the kind of science on which you base policy. But Harvard, I guess being Harvard, <laughs> they have promoted their science and they will say in their papers, we believe policy should be made on the basis of our, our, our associative studies, our, mm. these associations that we find in our studies. You know, they're just huge problems. I mean, there's there's problems. They're they're based on the food frequency questionnaire that asks people, you know, what did you eat in the last six months? Well, like, I don't know what I ate yesterday, but yeah. like those have been shown to be highly unreliable. And then they take that incredibly unreliable data and they put it through all these statistical manipulations and there's something called multiple P testing we don't have to get into, but you know, it's very unreliable data. Hmm. But it's, um, it is actually why I was astonished to see when I really started digging into our dietary guidelines, most of our guidelines are based on this Harvard science. Uh, wow. And, you know, in the few instances where their kind of associate, their findings have been tested in randomized controlled clinical trials, they are correct zero to 20% of the time. That means 80 to 100% of the time they're wrong. It's incredible. We never, we never hear about that. And you're, you're working um, you're going tomorrow to DC. Uh, let's talk about that. that you're, what your current work is doing to help make this a little bit more evidence based so we're not just. Right. Well, you know, after writing a book, um, I first I, I realized that, the, that how are we going to change what is, you know, what kind of nutritional advice people are given? Like, surprisingly, it's just not true that you, you write a book and then everybody reads your book and then <laughs> everything changes. <laughs> So, you know, I realized like where is the rigidity in the system? And that is the dietary guidelines for Americans. That is the most important nutrition policy really in the world. You know, it is downloaded to all doctors, nu nutritionists, dietitians, like everybody on the front lines of working with patients, they just download the dietary guidelines. And, and so, and it dictates the food that is in hospitals and at school lunch programs and military rations and, you know, your mother and her elderly feeding, you know, her elderly home, what they feed them, I mean, everything. So, and they're not based on evidence. When I went and looked at what the evidence based was, I was like, okay, where's the Women's Health Initiative? And where's this trial? And where's that trial? And where's it? Turns out they don't, they've ignored all of the major NIH funded clinical trials on nutrition, all of them. They have never reviewed. And I knew that to be a fact because I published it in an article in the British Medical Journal and it was peer reviewed three times because the entire, you know, nutrition status quo tried to get that article retracted and they couldn't. So I know that fact is true. Um, and so the question is, how do we get these dietary guidelines based on the actual good rigorous evidence that comes from clinical trials? You know, what does that evidence show? It shows that the high carbohydrate diet we're told to eat is has no proven benefits, no proven health benefits of any kind, the high carbohydrate, low fat diet. It demonstrates that saturated fat has zero effect on cardiovascular mortality, zero. That evidence also shows that people who restrict carbohydrates are able to reverse obesity, type two diabetes, heart disease. So that's really important information that needs to be in our guidelines, right? Just that. Or you could also go on, like salt recommendations. Mm. Lower is not better for salt for everybody. Yeah. It's only true for hypertensive people who are eating high salt diets. So how do we fix our dietary guidelines? Well, it turns out it's super political. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, there's not strong legislation defining what kind of science they need to consult, that they need to adhere to, like, the regular rules of science, which is to prioritize clinical trials over epidemiological studies. It's... It's um, the dietary guidelines are housed at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where they ought not to be, because the mission of the Department of Agriculture is to sell more agriculture hmm. to Americans. The dietary guidelines are supposed to tell people what to maybe restrict in order not eat in order to be healthy or what to eat more of. And so it's never been a happy home for the dietary guidelines. Wow. Major um, conflict of interest. Yeah, pretty major conflict wow. of interest. So what's the next step for you? Well, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm doing this work. I founded a group called the Nutrition Coalition. It's a not-for-profit group. It accepts no money from any interested industry. Mm. We are working in Washington um, to try to ensure that we can have guidelines that are based on good evidence in order to make people healthy. That's you know, amazing. Good for you. You should not have a government telling people, giving people like a one-size-fits-all diet that makes 
most of America sick. Right. That's just wrong. Nina, this is amazing. I'm really grateful for this conversation and your work. Uh, I think everyone should read The Big Fat Surprise. It's an amazing, amazing <laughs> book. Really, I mean, it's life-changing. The decisions and and uh, for, for people's own health and their families and the people they love and care about, future generations, I, I think it's important. Whether you're vegan or carnivore, it doesn't matter. I think it's super important. Um, I know you're active on Twitter. Where's the best like place for people to catch you? I'm at Big Fat Surprise on Twitter. Uh, I have a website that is ninatichels.com, uh, N-I-N-A-T-E-I-C-H-O-L-Z. Um, and I'm also working at the Nutrition Coalition, so go check out that site, which is nutritioncoalition.us, uh, awesome. and talks about the work that we're doing in Washington, D.C. Cool. I'll definitely put that in the show notes. Thank check you. It out. Thanks so much. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. I love talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.